So you've given a sort of sketch of what the different hemispheres do, and I know it's quite tricky to, to pin it down exactly. And like you say, they're both involved in everything. Uh, but if you had to sum up, I, I, you say that it used to be the case that people would think left brain is like, I don't know, uh, reason, rationality, you know, um, language maybe. And the right brain is like art, music, poetry. And and that's misleading. I, I It seems like you're saying, could you give us maybe three better words on each side of the brain to try to approximate what it is that these uh, these hemispheres are responsible for? Well, I think the point is, uh, I mean, if, if I was to answer your question outright, I mean, one pairing would be the left hemisphere is, um, in a way, only aware of, only interested in what can be made um, unambiguous and explicit, whereas the right, right. hemisphere is capable of sustaining things that are uh, on the surface of them of them perhaps opposites, but that coexist and need one another and are perhaps at the same time in different ways present in the situation. It's also much better at understanding the implicit. So there was some truth in what you just said, um, but l let me try and separate it out. So it, as I said, the, the difficulty with the way we used to think was it was about what they were doing. So reason, language, pictures, emotions. But in each of those cases, I, I can very clearly explain that, for example, language, some of it is very much a part of the left hemisphere. And what is very, very largely true is that speech, the, the, the articulation of, of speech is in almost everybody in the left hemisphere. But that's not the whole of language. And the most important part of understanding language actually is supplied by the right hemisphere. So the left hemisphere is a little bit like a computer that's been given um, the Oxford English Dictionary and a book of rules of syntax and is trying to decode the message. Whereas the right hemisphere sees that the meaning of this is something that is not being stated that is quite different. I mean, a very, very simple everyday example is if, if, um, the, the, the um, if you're speaking in an auditorium and 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 you say um, it, it's very hot in here, and the the, the left hemisphere is saying uh, he's pointing out that on a hot day in a room with a lot of people it's getting warm. No prizes for that. But the right hemisphere understands what he's really saying is could you switch on the air conditioning or open a window? So th the implicit meaning is what the right hemisphere understands, only the explicit, the left hemisphere. Now, when you think about it, so much of what is truly important in language, uh, even in everyday language, is metaphorical in nature, sometimes ironic, oblique. It may be uh, as important what is not being said as what is being said. Um, poetry, in fact, is something the right hemisphere is much better at than the left. And that's because its linguistic capabilities are different from those of the left. The left are to do with narrowing down on a certainty. In fact, if you wanted to make another difference between the left and right that is global, the left hemisphere's whole raison d'etre, if you like, is to try to narrow down to a certainty. Whereas the raison d'etre of the right hemisphere is to open up to a possibility. So it's always saying yes, but it might not be that. Ramachandran calls the right hemisphere the devil's advocate because it's it's seeing other possibilities here. So so that's true of, of language. It's true of reason too. So some kinds of reasoning are better done by the left hemisphere. But when you get beyond the carrying out of rote procedures, um, often the right hemisphere is better able to understand the meaning of a calculation. So the left hemisphere is better at times tables, partly because they're all recited and ingested in that way in childhood. And it, it, it follows rules and procedures. It's very good at that. It, it is, in fact, a bureaucrat. <laughs> it was an, appointed as the emissary, you know, the one that would go about and be a high-functioning bureaucrat for the master. The master's the one that sees the whole picture. So this is true of reason and language just as much as anything else. And to come to emotions, the, the, the most lateralized of all emotions is anger, and it lateralizes to the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is not a cool customer. It is not without emotions. It tends to 
have more self-centered, self-righteous emotions and more social emotions. But the deeper ones like empathy and melancholy and so on are more appreciated by the right hemisphere and so on. I could go on. But what I'm really pointing out is it's the the mode in which you're thinking about whatever it is will tell you which hemisphere is more important, not the actual um, sphere of activity, of human activity. Yeah. Um, what I'm interested in, I suppose, is what this means for us, because we've got these two different hemispheres sort of governing different ways of being in the world. Like you say, it's not so much a different uh, way of thinking about the world, but different ways of being in the world. It's just a different way to react. I mean, you often see people have discussions with each other and it feels like they just don't understand where each other are coming from. And the terminology of saying one is being too left brain and one is being too right brain can be very helpful there. It's kind of like if you see Jordan Peterson and Richard Dawkins have a conversation about God and religion. And Peterson is talking about sort of narrative and how things are truer than true and that, you know, it's kind of fiction, but it's a, a special kind of fiction. And then Richard Dawkins being like, I want to know if you put a camera in, you know, if you put a, put a camera in front of the, the tomb, would you see a man walk out of it? Like, did it literally happen? And it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, it seems more understandable to me that Richard Dawkins is baffled by Jordan Peterson being asked, did the Exodus story happen? And Peterson responds, it's still happening. That's his response, quite, quite baffling. Um, but it seems equally baffling to Jordan Peterson when somebody asks him, you know, do you think it actually happened? Though? Like, do, literally, do you think that a man rose from the dead? Do you think that Jesus was born of a virgin? And he's like, I don't even know how to begin answering that question. I, I don't have the, the requisite uh, understanding of the terms that you're using. That seems absolutely baffling. Do you think that that is... So a, a sort of a conflict like that, something like a, a battle between left brain thinking and right brain thinking? Well, I rather resist these rather simple um, ways of using the terms, but I, I, I can't uh, entirely disagree with you. I think that ultimately when you start unpacking the way in which the right and the left hemisphere see the world, you you can see that there are such differences. I mean, in many ways, Richard Dawkins um, is a scientific reductionist. He, he's a reductionist materialist. Um, I hope I hope I'm not doing him an injustice in saying that. But I think he therefore misunderstands the meaning of many things, uh, and and one of them is that when it comes to certain things like, for example, consciousness, the ability to grasp it, to pin it down, to say what it is and where it arises, this is almost the wrong way to approach it because it's not a thing like that. It's not a, another thing in the world alongside the things that consciousness allows us to be aware of. And God is not a thing in the world in the way that a rock or a stone or a tree is a thing in the world, or, or at least we, I would begin to want to qualify that as well. But, but you know, for these purposes, let's say a, a bicycle is, is a thing in the world, but God is not a, a, a very complicated machine. He's not a very complicated anything of the, the kind that we know. And so to, to try to approach God in that way is, 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 is going to produce no in insight into what people mean. And you have to be a very, either a very arrogant or a very confident person to say, well, all these people who think that they understand something that I can't see, they're just wrong because I can't see it. Uh, another way of looking at it would be, well, maybe I need to revise my thoughts about what is true. And I, I know this sounds like sort of hedging one's, one's bets. But is there a truth that can be stated in, in words that is true to what human nature is? So is human nature, in other words, something that can be written down in a scientific text and that pins down and exhausts what a human being is? 
Now, human beings we know exist, and we all have experience of them. But in order to convey the realities of what a human being is, encounters, and is capable of, you'd have to turn to art. You'd have to turn to the works of Shakespeare. You'd have to turn to narratives. You'd turn to stories, to great myths, with, which explain our relationship to a divine realm or to the cosmos or to one another. Um, and if you don't have, and I think some people are just born without the capacity to feel what it is that art tells us, what poetry tells us, what music tells us, what rituals tell us, what narratives tell us, then you won't understand why you're missing a very great deal because you're trying to make it all fit into a very, uh, 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 onto a Procrustean bed. You're trying to cut off everything that doesn't fit into this one <laughs> way of looking at things. And to make this um, clear, in, in, in the ancient world, in the ancient Greek world, and these people were by no means fools or, 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 I mean, they were the first scientists in the modern sense. So Dawkins should hold them in great respect. And they did make extraordinary scientific advances. But they didn't think that these advances would tell them the answers to the big questions like what is a human being? What is it? What does consciousness mean? Where is it? Who has it? What is the divine? What do we mean when we talk about the sacred? Which almost everybody um, experiences and, and, and ha finds a need to talk about the sacred, even if they don't use the term God. It doesn't really matter. And so in this ancient Greek world, there were two conceptions of truth, mythos, or mythos, as it would be in, in originally, and logos. And, and mythos has given us the word myth, and logic, logos has given us the word logic. But they believe that the big truths, the really deep truths, the, the, the great truths, could only be encompassed by, by poetry, by narrative, by what falls in the realm of myth. And that logic was the sort of thing that a lawyer would do in a courtroom to settle a dispute and decide how much money was owed by one person to another. So it operated on a much more trivial realm. Now you can say I'm only interested in that trivial realm in which things can be measured and demonstrated by a photograph and so forth. But do you believe in love? Do you think that love is real? If you don't think it's real, I pity you because it's the most staggering experience in life and it has many forms. Uh, there's the love one has, erotic love for a, a partner. There is the love one has for nature. There is for those of us who sense a, a, a something greater and divine. There is the love one has for that. But love cannot be demonstrated in a laboratory. It cannot be manipulated. It can't be measured in any way. Does that make it unreal? Not at all. So I, I feel this is just a, a, a huge... Um, discrepancy between a very narrow idea of what truth is and a broader one. And if you'll permit me, I just want to say something about truth there, that there are two, well, there are many ways, of course, of thinking about what truth is and many types of theory and philosophy about how to, how to think of truth, but two that are very important because they're, they're quite different and we can recognize them are truth as correctness which is really this closing down on a precise form of words or measurement that encompasses what it is that we are looking at. There's something out there which is the truth, and I'm going to take steps which lead me in a linear fashion towards that truth, and I get closer and closer to that truth, which is an entity somewhere. And the other is that truth is a process of discovery, of unveiling. And when I say discovery, I mean literally uncovering uncovering the accretions that have come between us and a deeper truth that is not discernible by the everyday eye of reason. The everyday eye of reason is very valuable. I, I very much respect reason and science, and they've served me well for many, many years. And, and you know, I, I worry that nowadays, in fact, both of them are coming under attack. Um, people are, are discrediting science unless it fits with the narrative of what they would like politically to think is true. That um, people are um, discarding reason if they don't find that it leads to the place they want to go. 
And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not detaching them. I'm just saying they have limitations. Intuition has limitations too, but it also has great powers to put us in touch with things that science alone won't take us to. And indeed, much of science was actually solved not by the scientific method, but by a process of intuitive approach towards a gestalt, a shape, a form, which gave the answer to a mathematician or to a scientist.